Everybody knows that cars have been getting smarter over the last couple years. If cars are anything like our other smart devices, pretty soon they'll be driving to pick up our dry cleaning without us. <laughs> okay, not really. But once your product is smart, the next thing that needs to happen is that they need to get connected. And as you know, it's only really a matter of time before our cars have wireless networks. If you're watching this webcast, you're probably one of the people who will make that happen. But doing Wi-Fi in a car environment is really hard. You don't just take your home router, hook it up to the cigarette lighter, and you're good to go. There is a whole slew of super complex issues that you have to understand and deal with. Emerging standards you need to be aware of and understand how to utilize. And that doesn't even scratch the surface of what you need to go through to get your next SOC to support vehicular Wi-Fi. Okay, digital dudes, I'm going to go ahead and use a bad word here. RF. I know, I know, you're running for the hills in terror. But hang with me for a second. RF isn't so scary if you have the right kind of help. Fortunately, Global Foundries has partnered with Katina to make this all easier for us and drive us toward a new era of automotive networking applications. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk, and today my guests are Fayez Singaporewala from Global Foundries and Mats Carlson of Katina, and we're going to talk about how to get that scary RF portion of your next design done in a snap. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you can click on that Download Now button below your player. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. Thank you so much for joining me today, Fayez. Thanks. Uh, good to be here. So I understand we're going to be talking about Katina's Wi-Fi solution on Global Foundry's RF CMOS platform. Tell us a little bit more about RF CMOS solutions at Global Foundries. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, at Global Foundries, we basically uh, have comprehensive platforms for high-frequency wireless connectivity for low-power applications. And we enable these designs with three focus areas. Okay. One is uh, we build them on robust logic-compatible process technologies. So this allows uh, customers to reuse standard cell IPs, mm -hmm. uh, memory compilers without starting from scratch. Great. Also, we have accurate silicon validated models, which is very key for RF designs mm -hmm. to reduce the uh, design iterations. Mm -hmm. And to support all of these, we have extensive EDA ecosystems for SOC designs. So therefore, the designers can uh, use all of these to have a very successful RF CMOS SOC design. Great. So I understand that every process isn't appropriate for RF design. What process technologies are supported by your RF CMOS platform? Mostly RF designs are meant for low power designs. Mm -hmm. So we built all our RF uh, CMOS solutions on low power platforms. And uh, we have RF solutions from mature technologies from 0.35 micron to 40 nanometer low power platform available today. Okay. And we are aggressively uh, developing solutions at 28 uh, nanometer super low power platform as well. So this is not your first rodeo with RF, right? <laughs> Tell me more about what past successes you've had with RF designs. Sure, for the advanced nodes, actually, we have had uh, a lot of success. For our 65 nanometer node, we have more than 500,000 wafers shipped. Wow, okay. Um, and the applications include uh, Bluetooth, wireless LAN, mobile communications, mobile TV, uh, LTE applications as well. And um, we also developed a sub-node called 55 nanometer. Okay. And um, that was available in mid-2011. And within a month of that, we already had a full product tape out, which yielded 85% on the first uh, run itself. So that's a wow. testament to our robust process as well as our accurate models. Mm -hmm. And um, we have uh, multiple products that are taping out this year and expected to ramp at, a, at the second half of this year. For 40 nanometer, we 
had the uh, design kit available towards the end of last year in September. And um, early this year, we had a prototype tape out, which also was fully functional on the first run itself. Wow, okay. And uh, that is going through a ramp later on this year. And we have multiple uh, customers on this technology node as well that will be taping out this year. So pretty good stuff. Absolutely. So one of the biggest obstacles in RF design is noise. How do we deal with noise as we push into more and more performance? That's a good question, actually. Um, as we scale, the FT improves dramatically. As you can see, going from 130 nanometer node to 65 and beyond, mm -hmm. the, the FT noise actually improves very, very quickly. But all these performance improvements does not really help if, if your noise also goes out of whack. Right. So as you can see from this slide, our noise performance actually tracks the ITRS roadmap very, very closely and even outperforms it uh, at some nodes. So you get a FT gain, a, a dramatic increase in that, but the noise degradation is very limited. So I know that extra process steps are required to support some RF features. Tell me about what types of devices you can support with your base process and what devices require extra processing steps. Yes, um, what you said is exactly right. We actually have two main categories of RF devices. Uh, we have the what we call essential RF devices, which have no mask adders compared to the uh, logic platform. So these includes, uh, you know, the RF transistor, obviously, mm -hmm. LD MOS devices, uh, MOS capacitors, MOM capacitors, and uh, even uh, inductors. But uh, sometimes uh, RF designers need some flexibility in uh, RF designs. So therefore, we also enable MIM capacitors and precision polyresistors to enable this flexibility. But they come at a very minimal cost. Okay, I'm ready to start my RF development project. And I want to get to market as fast as I can. How do I do that? It's a good question. Uh, and, you know, we at Global Foundries recognize the fact that RF IP is uh, unlike other IP mm -hmm. where you can just drop in into your design. Right. RF IP actually requires a lot of customization. Mm -hmm. So if you start RF IP development from scratch, Going through the cycles of uh, design and validation and redesign, that would probably take you between two to two and a half years. Wow. So that's a really long time. Now, to reduce that, you could use IP that you have at other nodes and port it over to the desired node. Mm -hmm. And that would reduce your time to market by uh, 12 months. But if you had the uh, IP platform already validated at the desired tech node, you could reduce that even further by three to four months. So uh, your total time to market reduction would be between 13 to 16 months. Wow, that's impressive. This is why we work with Katina. We have been working with Katina from 2009 very aggressively to build up our IP portfolio together with them so that our customers can enjoy this uh, reduction in time to market mm -hmm. when they do the RF designs. So let's bring Mats into this discussion right now. Welcome, Mats. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. So, I understand Katina are the big experts on things like WiMAX and Wi-Fi. Tell us a little bit about Katina and your partnership with Global Foundries. Yes, we have been cooperating now with Global Foundries uh, for a few years, as I as already mentioned. And we have brought into this cooperation our expertise on system and uh, RF development. So, mm -hmm. we have defined a complete uh, platform targeting initially WiMAX application, but also later on Wi Fi applications. Okay. And we have made use out of the CMOS technologies that uh, Global Founders provides in this cooperation. And we have developed this complete platform, including RF and baseband functionality uh, so we can actually validate and prove on silicon these uh, complex functions and systems. So tell me more about this unique platform you have to help people with this. Yes, so this platform includes a complete transmit and receive section and baseband processor as well and uh, this is uh, we have already built in the necessary functions that, we, that a customer would need. So they can actually, by taking our already validated system, we can put a new system together and a new product together for a customer on a very short, short time. So that's actually the background to why we have this uh, development. 
And uh, at the moment, we have also several customers we are working with, and, and we are now customizing what we have as a platform. And we develop now several different uh, customer versions and products in the Global Founders Technologies. Then we have a platform that we have developed, or a development platform that we are using for this development. And this platform is actually very comprehensive, so, so the customers can actually use this if they also would like to make use of their own baseband if they have that. So we can take our RF section and integrate that and connect it up with the customer baseband. So in that way, we can very quickly address and approach a new product for, for a specific customer that has uh, certain requests out of this. Fantastic. So, Mats, it seems like just about everything is Wi-Fi enabled these days. Heck, I even have a Wi-Fi enabled scale. So tell us more about the size of this market and what the hot opportunities are. Yeah, it's a little bit frightening to see Wi-Fi in more or less any application. So, it so, is. <laughs> so maybe you can misuse that information <laughs> from your scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, anyway, you see a lot of uh, interest and a lot of new applications coming up where you find Wi-Fi enabled in it. And uh, you can see on this graph the huge increase in shipments of, of uh, Wi-Fi chipsets both in the past, but also in the future. So there is mm -hmm. a, a forecast of uh, like 16% growth each year from now on Wow! in a few years to come. And the total volumes have actually surpassed uh, 1 billion devices already Phew. for one year only. On the right here, you see some of the new applications that we are addressing and that we see also uh, coming into play mm -hmm. with the connective homes, uh, TVs that you connect to Wi-Fi and so on, uh, health and fitness and medical, and that's your scale coming right. in, into, <laughs> into play there. But we address at Katina also the automotive field, oh. where, where we have car-to-car -car and car-to-infrastructure communication, which is also a hot topic coming up. And on the next slide here, you see also the new applications again here. We see 11AC, and that's a standard for uh, higher data rates or higher data throughput, which is also required for like video to video communication. Mm -hmm. But also this 11P standard, which is also named as WAVE or car ITS applications. Okay. We see also a trend in that the products previously using standalone uh, chips like uh, by CMOS devices using mm -hmm. by CMOS technologies are reclining and re being replaced by SOC devices in CMOS. So, so that's why we believe that this cooperation with Global Foundries is going to be very successful for us and also for the customers of Global Foundries. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how excited I am to have Wi-Fi in my car. Tell us more about how this is going to happen. Yeah, this is a very interesting application where you see a lot of new interesting use cases ca coming into play. Mm -hmm both from a security point of view, but also from, from a pure data transfer point of view, where you maybe want to upgrade and upload new maps into your GPS and so on. Okay. So we see that we will have communication from cars to infrastructure, but also from cars to other cars. So you mm. can actually see the, the cars in your vicinity or neighborhood. So you don't overtake a car if another car is approaching you in a very fast way. So, so this graph here or this picture illustrates that in a nice way. So tell us about the differences between our home Wi-Fi versus mobile Wi-Fi. Yes, there are quite significant differences, actually. And uh, the biggest difference is actually that the automotive or the car is actually moving very fast. You, you drive along very fast. And that means that the uh, link must be very secure and also must be very robust. And mm -hmm. you have to handle uh, things like Doppler shifts and also multipath signals that is diminishing the performance otherwise in a normal home application. These things are handled mostly in the basebands on the baseband side, but there are also significant differences on the RF and the hardware side as well. And we have listed those here. So the first one is that the frequency range uh, dedicated for 11P is on the high side of the 5 gigahertz band. Okay. So from 585 to 5.925. And on this graph, you see seven different channels being used for 11P applications. It's 10 megahertz channels wide. You see also that we have a much tighter requirement on the spectrum mask. Mm. So when you transmit a signal, you have to have a, a much tighter mask that you have to fulfill compared to 11A. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, you have to also be able to accommodate for much higher adjacent and, and also non-adjacent channels. Mm -hmm. So that also puts new stringent requirements on your hardware. So Mats, let's get into the guts of this thing. Yeah, so uh, on the next slide here, we see a receive section illustrated, a typical receive section. And imagine that you have a signal coming into the input of that device. Okay. Then that signal is processed through first the RF sections, and then that means that the signal is scaled up in magnitude. 
and then that puts much tougher requirements on linearity on the RF devices in the in the in the resilience chain. Furthermore, you have to have much better phase noise of the synthesizer as well. Mm -hmm. Also, when you come into the baseband section, then you have to attenuate the unwanted signals in an accurate manner. So the unwanted signals does not ruin your signal performance as well and drown your wanted signal. So that means that both the baseband filter and also the AD converter coming in later have much tougher requirements, both on linearity, but also increased dynamic range. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt, how real is this? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, the next slide, we illustrate a little bit uh, what also Fayaz mentioned earlier, that by having the platform already silicon proven from Wi-Fi for Wi-Fi, then uh, we see that we have actually been able to reduce now time to market or time to functional silicon for our customers in a very good way. We started discussions with customers in the second quarter of last year, mm -hmm. and we taped out the first product here now in, in October 2011. So wow. in roughly half a year, we, we from discussions with customers to tape out. And the main differences we have from the previous platform is that we have removed all the unwanted functions and features of, mm -hmm. of, of the previous device. Like the baseband processor, we have taken out the unwanted frequency bands, the AD converters are removed. We have also now support for another frequency band, which we did not have before, but that's a small modifications which we can handle. Mm -hmm. We have added a second synthesizer also to be able to support dual channel operation. As okay. Well. So, Fayez, do you want to interject here? Yeah, if I, if I can. Actually, um, Matt's brought up a good point. As I mentioned earlier, we at Global Foundries encourage our customers to use pre-validated IP platforms, which they can easily customize to meet their specific needs and take advantage of the much reduced time to market. So in this case, the customers needed only certain features from the platform, and these were easily removed and revalidated in a very short time thus benefiting this particular customer with a very aggressive time schedule. Great. So Matt, tell us what kind of performance we can expect from this solution. Yes, I will give you an indication on the performance that we have first on the receive section, which you see on this slide, where we have the noise figure over frequency together with the gain. And we have actually reduced the gain quite a lot uh, and still maintain the very good noise figure that we have of this transceiver. So uh, we actually surpassed the requirements that we have on noise figure. So that's very good. Very nice. If you look at the transmit section, here you see the uh, transmitted spectrum and you see also the both the 11P and the 11A mask. And you see that we are well below or within the 11P mask, which is required. So that's also very good. On the next slide, you see here a summary of the main uh, performances that we have of this device. First of all, the frequency range, it's going to be operated at roughly the full 5 gigahertz band, but also the 700 megahertz band, as I mentioned before. And we see that the measured results are much better compared to what we actually require. Also, the noise figure is better, as I already mentioned. The input signal that we should handle is also slightly better compared to what we need. The gain range is also higher than we need. The filter cutoff frequencies, here we have not yet modified what is actually needed for 11P because this is a legacy from WiMAX, but we maintain this just to be able to get to the market very quickly. But now in the product version that we will tape out at the end of this year, we will also take away those unwanted frequency bands there. The receive sensitivity is also better, uh, mostly due to the noise figure that is better. The output power is on spec and the transmit gain control is also on spec as well. The linearity in the, receipt, in the transmit section is also better, so we have a better error vector magnitude performance than required. So, and then at the end, we have also the current consumption and the supply voltages that we supply this device with. Great. All right, Matt, what model of a car do I need to buy to get one of these? Yeah. We see from our customers that are using our device and putting that into their products, we see that they are planning to launch products into cars from the model year 2015. So okay. in a few years time, we will see this starting to ramp up. So maybe in five years from now, you will see that this more deployed on a broader scale in cars. Okay, I'll hold on to my car until 2015 then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So tell us a little bit about your roadmap with Global Foundries moving forward. Yes, so we don't stop with this, of course. We have to continue. And uh, we are continuing now not only addressing 11P applications, but we are also looking into 11AC, how we should br bring in support for 11AC as well. And furthermore, we are also looking into how the customer can reduce their cost as well, both uh, by reducing the number of external components. Mm -hmm. And this we address by introducing single-ended RF ports. So, so the requirement of having external balance will disappear. 
we are also look into how we should be able to reduce the dye area altogether. Mm-hmm. So those things are on a high level, the things that we are doing with the platform for Wi-Fi applications. Furthermore, we are also uh, looking into not only Wi-Fi by itself, but we are also addressing the market where you have connectivity devices with Combo. And we have at Katina mm-hmm. an FM GPS IP, which we are now porting into 40 nanometer. And later we will also, by having that in 40 nanometer from Global, we can also merge that with our Wi-Fi platform as well. So, so we can offer to the customers of Global Foundries a complete combo with FM GPS and Wi-Fi as well. Fantastic. So, uh, Amelia, in, in conclusion, I would say that having proven RFIP significantly reduces the time to market. And this is not just a PowerPoint slide that we have. This is happening in, in real time right now, as we talked about earlier. And we see this going forward for our customers as being a great value to them. Currently, with our cooperation with Katina, we have in our RF technologies proven system IP for Wi-Fi that includes the 802.11 A, B, G, and N Great. compliancy, but also the wave compliancy that Matt's talked about intensively, that is the 802.11 P, which we believe that will gain a lot of traction going forward. And we are ready at Global Foundries and with Katina to address this market and give our customers an edge with a very aggressive time to market schedule. Yeah, and furthermore, as I already mentioned, we are also addressing these enhancements of what we are already doing. But in addition to that, we are also active in 60 gigahertz applications at Katina. And for these new developments that we are working on, we are working very closely together with some key customers. And there is, of course, always room for additional key customers that we can work together with to really define these systems in a very neat way to make use of the technologies that we have access to with Global Foundries. So uh, we believe at Katina very much in this cooperation, and we look forward very much for the further cooperation together with Global Foundries. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining me, Mats and Fayez. It was a pleasure speaking with you both. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. And before we go, don't forget to click that Download Now button below the player to download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. For Chalk Talk, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the On Demand section of eejournal.com.